Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you so much for agreeing to join me. It was a great excuse to actually get something nice on. <laughs> you know what? I, I've, I've been getting into jeans twice a week for this cover and natter, and it's game changing. <laughs> it's, yeah. I feel like you have to try and get into jeans at least once a week to check they still fit, you know? I mean, you're telling me. I, it's a big struggle. Every single week they get a little bit tighter, and obviously that's because I'm working so hard in training and everything, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, all the squat gains, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but no, thank you so, so much. I'm not going to lie, I'm very excited for this one. Um, because when, so six weeks ago, when I started this, I kind of put together a wish list, a wish <laughs> list, but all the sports that I enjoy watching the most. Um, I used to play cricket at school, still love it. It obviously helps that Essex are doing so well <laughs> at the moment. So I've, I've always loved cricket, and I mean, yourself, you, you were number one on the hit list. I hope you don't mind me saying. <laughs> I had a conversation with one of my closest family friends, Joe Hart, who plays cricket for Kent in one of the junior teams, and he said, you've got to get Tammy Beaumont on. He said, you've got no chance, but you've got to try and get her, get, get her on. So I'm thrilled to pieces that you've agreed. Thank you so much. No, thanks for having me on. I think as women's sport got uh, got to stick together. So, yeah, I was definitely up for it. Absolutely. Well, I mean, one of the finest cricketers in the country, I think it's fair to say. So, right-handed opener and wicketkeeper for England, Kent, London Spirit. You started playing the sport age six with the helping hand of your older brother and your dad that were both involved in the sport. Is that correct? Yeah, I basically idolised my older brother and... Um, yeah, it's all, all his fault, really. <laughs> OK, well, I'd, I'd quite like to pick your brains on that a little bit later. But, yeah, 10 years later from starting picking up the bat for the first time, you made your Kent debut in 2007 at the age of 16, which is outrageous. And since then, I mean, you've won numerous county championships with the team, captain in the team, um, and that success has replicated on the international scene as well, um, obviously representing England in um, ODIs, T20s and the test format of the game so um, I think it's fair to say as I said I've got one of the finest players um, in the country at the moment so I'm thrilled to pieces and I'm so excited by this honestly <laughs> I can't wait um, but anyway I, I'd like to kick things off with asking you what everyone wants to know about you um, and that's how you like your tea okay so I'm gonna do that by asking you five quick fire questions if that's all right yeah I'm ready. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Breakfast tea or herbal tea? Breakfast tea. Tea bag or loose tea leaves? Tea bag. Ginger nut biscuit, plain digestive or chocolate chip cookie? Chocolate chip cookie. Yeah, my type of girl. When is the best time to drink tea? First thing in the morning or last thing at night? First thing in the morning. Agreed. Um, okay, does tea taste better when made by yourself or made by someone else? Someone else. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Controversial. Do you put your trust in someone else getting the tea right then? Actually saying that, someone else as long as it's not my mum. Right. My mum has really weak tea. Um, and I kind of joke that it's milky water really. So as long as it's someone who makes strong tea, I'm happy. So, so your mum's not quite uh, mastered the art of making tea just quite yet? Well, I mean, she obviously likes the tea how she likes it, okay. to be fair. I'll, I'll let her off, but it's just not my style of tea. Uh, okay, well, you and me both. But, I mean, that's fair to say. We've learnt a lot. I mean, I'm quite impressed that you chose the chocolate chip cookie, similar to myself. Um, but, yeah, anyway, we'll kick things off. And I'll pre-warned you that I asked all of my couple and natural guests three questions, okay? So my first question comes from your Kent counterpart, GB hockey legend, Susanna Townsend. Now, Towner, for those that know her, is an absolute nutter. And this question is hands down exactly the type of question that I would expect from her. So I apologize in advance, but it came, the inspiration came early on in, on Monday morning, basically, kept her up all night, apparently, trying to think of a question for you. She wants to know, if you go to the loo in the middle of the night, do you flush the toilet and risk waking up your housemates? Or do you leave it 
and risk people in your house waking up to your unflushed toilet the next morning? Question. Uh, I think if it was going to risk waking up the housemates, I would leave it. Would you? Yeah. Yeah, and hope that I woke up early to, you know, get rid of it. Sort it. I mean, I'm quite a light sleeper, so I would have to agree with you in that if my housemate flushed the loo in the middle of the night and wake me up, I'd be furious. I'm not going to lie. I'm thinking what makes people more grumpy? Lack of sleep or having to flush the toilet? I'm thinking... Yeah. Lack of sleep, definitely. Uh, I agree, I agree. And to be fair, Towner said exactly the same when, um, when she asked the question. So I hope that, likes that answer too. We can just see that. <laughs> Multitasking whilst on another meeting for this. To be fair, she did pre-warn me about 10 minutes ago saying that she had a meeting. Can you make sure it's recorded so she can watch it as soon as possible? So she's obviously ditched the other meeting to hear exactly what you just said to answer number one. So <laughs> here's to that. Um, but moving on, I guess what other people want to hear about is obviously your cricket expertise. So casting your mind back to when you first started playing the sport, and um, I read a really interesting article that you f your first ever hardball cricket game was aged eight, and you played for your brother's under-11 team, which he captained, and your dad was the coach. Is that correct so far? <laughs> yes, correct so far. And basically, your brother's team was shorter players. You obviously backed yourself, asked your dad if you could play. He obviously allowed you to play. And then that's probably the best decision he's ever made in his whole entire life, because look what's happened since. Um, and I guess I want to know, so for a lot of young girls aged eight they may not have the confidence to want to play in a boys team or might not have a coach that is so supportive and willing to allow them to play um and i guess with the like social perception that cricket may be you know historically a, a sport for men um what what do you say to that in terms of now that you've reached the top of your sport and uh, you're obviously you know achieved so much in your career um, how important is it to inc like increase the opportunities for young girls, say, age eight, like yourself, um, back in the day, and challenging that social perception of, of women's cricket? Yeah, I think, I think it has come quite a long way, yeah. even since I started. So when I did start playing uh, with, uh, girls' club cricket, my closest club was an hour away from home. Yeah. And obviously, I'm very lucky my parents supported that and would drive me to training and games and whatnot. But now that I think there are a lot closer, a lot more options for young girls. But for me, it was always a case of why not? Why can't I? Why can't I play this game? Um, and I'm sure there's like loads of other girls in that situation. Most of my England teammates grew up playing boys cricket. That was just how it was. Um, but for me, yeah, that's the biggest one is, well, why can't I play? That was literally what I asked dad. Why can't I? And I was lucky enough, mum kind of chipped in well, yeah, she's right. She is better than the next bloke you're going to ring, the next kid you're going to ring. Like, why can't you play? Um, and challenge, challenge that stigma yeah. of it. Why, why can't I? What, prove me, prove, show me why I can't. Cricket is a good sport in that it's based on skill. It's not, yes, power comes into it. Yes, strength comes into it. Those sorts of things a little bit, but it is based on skill. So even though I might not have been as strong as the 11-year-olds I was playing against, I had the skill that I could cope with it. Um, and there's nothing better than proving people wrong. I think that's always been a massive motivator of mine. I had someone tell me when I was 11 year, years old, you'll never play for England, your hands are too no. small. Um, and they are, they are really small. But um, like, you yeah, that was almost more of a reason to say, well, watch me. Yeah, good for you. I mean, do you think actually having that confidence back then when you were aged eight has kind of helped you in terms of, as you said, it is a skill factor. You may not have had the, the strength and the power as, as some of your, your, the boys that were playing in the same team, but you had the skill, you had the technique. I suppose now, obviously, you're an opening batsman. Do you think, actually, that's helped you? Yeah, definitely. I think people often remark, getting a little bit too technical on cricket here, but I have a really high back lift. Um, right. And I actually think that's come from when I was quite small, quite... Um, quite little I was a very little eight-year-old um but actually I had to pick my bat up higher to almost get any swing on it so it's actually in the long run it's worked really well for me um and I think the biggest thing in sport is finding a way to adapt to what's happening I don't always think it's not always the strongest people 
it's not always the cleverest. It's the people that continually adapt to what happens in the game. So, uh, yeah, for me, I think that massively made me just learn to adapt and learn to cope and get better. Amazing. And then I guess I want to know, like, how many years were you playing in, say, a boys' team? And then when was it that you kind of made the shift in terms of have the opportunity to play with, with the, the girls? Um, so from when I was about 10 or 11, I played for Kent under 11 girls teams. Um, and then I pretty much started playing women's club cricket from when I was 12. Um, but I continued to play boys cricket um, all the way up to even just a few years ago. I was playing up here in the sort of Leicestershire um, men's Premier League just because it's, you know, a bit more local. It's a quite good competition. Um, and I've always really enjoyed it and got a lot from that. So um, I think while at the moment women's cricket still... Uh, struggle sometimes to be competitive at the right level. Um, so I'd play sometimes four years ago, I'd play women's club cricket on a Sunday and I'd be playing against sort of a 13 year old girl and her mum and an England player playing at that level as much as they probably enjoyed playing against someone like me. It's not quite the right competition level. Whereas if I go and play men's cricket, there's probably men that are slightly better than me or better than me. And I'm sort of playing along that side. So I've always really enjoyed kind of still doing it when I can but um, the last couple of years there's just been no time for that. Nah. I mean I guess I, I, I'm really interested actually I didn't know that that you'd play play um, f it versus the men and actually that makes perfect sense but I guess as you said you haven't had the time recently over the last few years because you've been so preoccupied elsewhere traveling around the world and there's one tournament that I think I'd be stupid not to ask you about um, so I think it's fair to say the Home World Cup in 2017, I remember watching it like it was yesterday and uh, I think it's fair to say you had the tournament of your life. <laughs> um, so not only did you become um, world champions, the fourth time that an English women's cricket team has um, won the title, but also, which is incredible, uh, you were player of the tournament and you scored outrageous 410 runs in the whole tournament. Is that correct? Have that I is, yeah. So yes. I actually only scored one more than the Indian captain. So I pretty much won player of the tournament by one run. <laughs> I mean, perfect. Sorry, not sorry. You, t you, t you took that title away from her and you crushed her dreams of being a world champion. So... I mean, yeah, poor, not, poor woman. <laughs> yeah, I bet you're not in a on a Christmas uh, card list, but um, yeah. So playing in the Home World Cup, um, obviously the pinnacle of your sport at a sold out Lords Cricket Ground, which is one of the most prestigious sporting venues in the whole world, and as you said, like beating India by the finest margins, it was nine runs that you won by. Um, I just thought, I want to know, like, what was it like to be a part of such a big moment in, in history within women's cricket in this country? Yeah, it was an absolutely crazy summer. Um, it, we kind of, we'd gone, we'd even, we planned it so far ahead, about a year in advance. It was all what we're going to do. We actually had um, one of your girls, Alex Danson, came and gave us a talk. Yeah. Uh, we went and did the Lords Tour back in March and Alex came and spoke to us about how you guys had gone about your your world cup medal um no your world your olympic medal i think it was okay. uh, yeah like the whole journey about that about being accountable to each other and all those kind of things and it it was a massive journey for a number of months together but um yeah on that day at lords i don't think it really hit me ha quite how important it was until we were stood there doing the anthems and the crowd was really loud i don't even think everyone was in yet they were still queuing we wow. were here and they were queuing back to the tube station at st john's wood and that only happens for like men's test matches. Yeah. And we were thinking like, no way, that can't be real. Yeah. Um, but it was when they always ring the five minute bell at Lords, um, And they got this, this lady called Eileen Ash, who's 104 years old at the time, um, who's the oldest living um, England player, men or, or male or female. Um, so she got to ring the bell. And then there was a box full of uh, the women's, the English women's team who had won in 1973 and 1993, who were both the, the two teams that had won in England. Wow. And I think at that moment, it kind of hit me that this wasn't just about the sort of 11, 15 of us that were taking the field that day. It actually was like the whole of women's cricket had worked for that moment to sell out Lords, um, to, you know, put women's cricket on the map in, in the whole world. Yeah. Um, and then for us to win, it was really just um like the cherry on top really it just made 
it just felt like it was sort of meant to be in a way um particularly because i think india were in control of that game for <laughs> probably 80 percent of it and it was only really that spell from anya at the end that really swung it back our way and and made it kind of destiny in a way i i've got goosebumps like just listening to you honestly it's incredible but like just thinking about it, you said that it didn't really sink in about the whole, you know, spectacle and the, the impact that this could have on the future of um, future of women's cricket. But did you ever in a million years, that moment that you first picked up a cricket bat, aged six, to in 2017 playing at Lords and then becoming a world champion, did, like, did you ever comprehend that that was going to be how your career would span out? Well, my mum tells the story of from me being 10, 11. Um, so we'd obviously go and watch dad play on a Saturday. And then at the end of the game, I'd get anyone and everyone who would to just throw a ball at me and I'd just be hitting it back at them. And I think an opposition player for, of my dad's team once threw it at me. And I was telling him, I'm going to play for England one day. I'm, I, I tell you now, I'm going to play for England one day. But um, I don't remember that. But that's the story my mum tells. Um, but no, I certainly didn't think that... Um, that I would kind of have the career I have had. Obviously, I was I dreamt of it. I dreamt of playing for England. That was the only thing going on for me at all. Only thing I've ever wanted to do. Um, but no, actually selling out Lords and the kind of viewing figures and everything like that. Just no, it's absolutely blown my mind. Yeah, um, how far it's come, really. I mean, so basically, I could call you Mystic Meg because you did call it back in the day. Um, but yeah, as you said, it's the whole. You know, you, you sold out, Lords. You had the whole country watching you guys on TV. You had the, you know, the awards that came with it, Team of the Year, you know, all the accolades that, that were rightly given to you guys afterwards. It's, it's phenomenal. And actually, do you think that you have seen that kind of legacy of a Home World Cup and also you guys winning a Home World Cup off of the back of it since 2017? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that was a big thing that we tried to do was remain kind of open to, you know, the young, the youth of today to try and really think they can relate to us and not that we're, you know, we're world champions. We're, you know, you can't quite relate to that kind of person. I, I would love young girls now to kind of see cricket as a, as a career and the coronavirus has unfortunately yeah. potentially delayed some of that a little bit. We were meant to go from at the minute, we've got about 17 full-time professionals and this year we're supposed to make it up to about 60. Um, but unfortunately, that's kind of delayed it a little bit, but it's still going to happen, um, which is kind of really good to see that, you know, our governing body has invested so heavily in trying to make it a job for more and more girls and not just a select few. Um, but certainly, the cup, like the few months after that, I was getting recognised on the tube in London. Well, yeah. And I was just like, oh, goodness, like, I'm going to have to make sure I, you know, look a bit better than I did <laughs> that day. But, um, yeah, all those kind of things. It just, um, it's absolutely crazy when the number of people that have said, oh, I was there that day. I, I you know, we watched you from that part of the crowd or, or whatever. It's just, um, it's just unbelievable, really, how, how far and wide it did kind of go in a way. Yeah, I mean... I just, I just, like, when you were saying just then, I, I think it'll be one of those moments when you guys won the 2017 World Cup, you will always remember where you were when, when that game was being played. And actually, I guess, as you said, like, the, the knock-on that your success has had on inspiring young girls and obviously, you know, making the, the women's cricket in this country be as just as big and, you know, shown just as widely. Um, within the media as the men I think that's credit to you guys for for all your hard work and success over the years and as you said like with the hundred and the and more professionalism within the within the league in this country I think that the only way is up for women's cricket and I'm excited for you yeah it's really it is really exciting time yeah. I think um you I think hopefully we don't just kind of inspire young girls I hope we kind of inspire young boys as well and it's it's kind of about the cricket and not what gender you are or, or whatever. But, um, yeah, it's certainly a good time to be part of, of women's sport, I think, in this country. Yeah. I think, arguably, you look back over the last sort of five, six years and our national women's teams have probably been slightly more successful than our men's. And um, I think that's a really great thing to have. Um, and that's why I kind of like to just champion, you know, not just women's cricket, but women's football, women's hockey, netball, just try and, you know, empower every single woman I don't care if a young girl you know 
doesn't play cricket if they choose to play hockey or they choose to do something else that keeps them active and, and gives them that kind of fulfillment that you can get from sport. Um, yeah, that's kind of my passion anyway. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, we have very similar passions. I guess that's why I'm doing this because I think, you know, sportswomen such as yourself are so inspiring and actually have such a big impact on so many different people's uh, lives. So, and I think that that has been shown by how many social media questions I've got for you. <laughs> I get asking. Um, I've been inundated by the, uh, by the cricketing world. So if you don't mind... Um, I'll kick things off with Fiona and she said really good question this when you get close to making 50 or 100 runs how easy is it to control your emotions and nerves <laughs> oh, that's something you definitely have to learn um, I've actually always found it really hard when my, the number of runs I've scored is actually on the board visible in the ground it's something you have to really work to put to the back of your yeah. mind uh, and not think too much about, oh, I'm, I'm on 95. You actually really have to just think about that one ball at a time. Um, or you're probably going to get out in on 95 sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I've always thought this. So I'm quite pleased Fiona's asked it. But do you, do, how easy is it for you to keep track of how many runs you're on? <laughs> I think some people find it a lot easier than others. I... I can only, I don't have the biggest con concentration span. I need to just be focusing on the next ball and the next ball and the next ball. If I'm thinking about, oh, if I hit a six, I'll be on 45 or however many balls. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> I think that's why you've had so much success uh, in the crease in cricket in your career because I would absolutely be the other person. I'd be going for glory and trying to hit sixes all the time to try and get to 50 as soon as I could. But you've got it down to a T, I think. But, um, but anyway, yeah, so... Another question from Joe on Instagram. Who is the best bowler you have faced in your career to date? Oh, that is a tough question. Um, if you don't say your brother here, he might take this um, to heart. No, he was a, he was a batsman wicketkeeper oh, as well. Yeah. Um, best bowler I've faced? Uh, potentially Megan Shutt from Australia. Um, she's not the quickest, but she does swing it a long way and she makes it quite difficult to score off. Uh, I can I can imagine when you're facing bowlers as well. It's quite a uh, it's quite a task, isn't it? Because you get the you get the spin, you get the in swingers, you get the fast pace. I mean, you see it all. I'd I'd just be trying to swing and hope for the best every single time. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, probably probably why I didn't didn't make it anywhere near the the standard that you did. But anyway, um, okay, this is a good question, and I hope you don't mind me asking. So this is from Kate on Instagram. How hard was it to overcome being knocked out of the World T20 semi-final due to the match being abandoned? Yeah, I've been asked that a few mm. times. It's, um, it's a really tough one, actually. I think when you... So I've played in semi-finals or finals where we've lost before. Yeah. And they hurt a lot. Like, you, you cry afterwards you, or you get a bit angry or there's a lot of emotion from the minute you lose or from the minute the medal goes to the, the other team or kind of from the end of the game or it's normally when I see my family that's normally when I get a bit teary or whatever but this one it was just weird it it kind of over the course of the day it was just raining and raining and raining and it was just looking like we're not getting on we're not getting on and obviously we knew that meant we were out yeah. and it kind of you don't get that overwhelming emotion right away so it actually I don't actually know if I am over it do you know what I mean I think it kind of is always going to be one that grates on you quite a lot and kind of you never really got to put your case forward. I think when you're beaten, either because you didn't play well or because, um, you know, the, the other team played better, I think you get that kind of um, grieving process of, right, okay, well, next time I'll work on this. Whereas this time it's like, well, we didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, it, it's kind of a tough one. I think it, it eventually it will motivate us to work harder to yeah. try and, you know, put that right next time. But it's it's quite hard when you don't really have that feedback of, whether you're good enough or not. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. I haven't really thought about it like that in the fact that actually it wasn't anything that you guys did. You didn't necessarily lose because India were better than you on that day. So actually it's hard to justify whether that's easier to take or not. But um, yeah, really interesting what you said. <laughs> um, okay, another one. I've got time for one more if you don't mind. Um, Lord, oh, Instagram. So um, oh, Australia no, are coming ranked number one in the cricket world rankings 
What do you think needs to happen in the future for England to be number one? Sorry, Emily, can you pause for a second. Oh, oh let me let me. Sorry, okay, my thing froze. Probably... Say it again. I'll say it again. So this is from Lorna on Instagram, and she wants to know: Australia are currently ranked number one in the world with England number three, what do you think needs to happen in the future for England to be number one in the world? Well, oh, that's a good question, that. Um, I think what was going on with the kind of investment in the, the domestic programme and getting 60 professionals was going to be really good. Um, Australia at the moment have about 95 to 100 professional players, so they have like a much bigger pool of players to pick from, um, kind of that higher... Um, We've got a lot of talent, but it's like do, doing all the work to have more international ready players. Um, and then I think it's just a case of belief yeah. in, in, in ourselves. Because um, I think man, like girl for girl in that team, when we play Australia, it is literally just which team performs on the day. But I think Australia just have that kind of uh, history of winning tough games, winning World Cups, winning in world tournaments that carries them through quite often. Whereas we're still kind of sometimes finding our feet and um, don't necessarily believe that we've got what it takes to really dominate them for quite a long time, I think. So, so in terms of um, opportunities for the next few years, have you got any like, um, so for example, the next Ashes trip, how would you approach that? Yeah, I guess we'll have to really think about the kind of mental side of the game as well as just the skills. Um, and our new coach is Australian, so hopefully she's going to um, give us some good tips and kind of really kind of hone us in on the skills that we need to beat them. Um, but also the likes of India uh, really coming up and starting to dominate on the world stage. Um, obviously, they're amazing in men's cricket um, and it's really good for the kind of global game that India are kind of really having some superstars come through so they're actually really hard to beat as well so we're gonna have to really make sure we're on our game and play them as well you've got some tough competition but i'm sure i'm sure lorna asked that because she firmly believes as do we all that you know in the near future you guys will take that top spot off of uh off of australia no doubt no doubt that's the plan that's the plan yeah absolutely well anyway um 30 minutes is nearly up i mean my cup of tea is pretty much empty um, so I've just got one final thing to ask you, if that's all right. Um, so I'm going to give you the power of what my first question for my next couple of Natter guests, which will be on Monday, um, should be. Okay, so make it a good one. Okay, well, I've really had to think about this. And I've actually, I asked my housemates for a few sort of ideas. Um, but in the end, I thought, what will get someone talking quite a lot? Um, so... If you could put one thing in room 101, so, you know, something that annoys you, your pet peeves that you can lock away forever, what would it be and why? Oh. everyone loves to rant. I think everyone loves to rant about something, so. Mate, I thought that, that would is good. That's very strong. Right, okay, come on then. You can't ask the question and not give me your answer. Uh, mine is, would be like 50 miles an hour zones on, on motorways. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, that does kill me. Makes I, it twice as long. I feel like I'm caught in two minds with slow walkers. Don't mm. get me wrong, I'm not one of those people that like weaves in and out, but I do think there should be a fast and a slow lane for walkers because it pains me. Um, I'll tell you what's annoying me at the minute. You know, social distancing. So obviously I've got a run close to home, that's fine, but it's the path isn't it's it's two meters wide but it's like only two meters wide and then nothing else and it's the people that walk along really slow like holding hands to width and they see you coming and you're like do you want to move no. out of the way or what like i've got to run in the hedge here because i'm obviously doing like a 4k time trial or something i can't stop but you know it's fine i'll, I'll run around you it's fine you heard it here first. Tammy Beaumont's been running in hedges rather than on pavements to keep her social distance. But well, you've got to socially distance. It's very important. I, I do agree. I mean, I, I got a little bit of um, rage the other week because it is, like, I get it. Some people are a bit oblivious to social distancing, so they don't really help the situation. 
But I literally found myself running in the middle of the road the other day. And I was like dodging in, in and out of traffic pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I've so, had to do that a couple of times. Yeah. The, t the tough life of being an athlete and keeping social distancing, eh? But uh, yeah, I'm right. excited to ask that question, actually. I, I'm <laughs> intrigued of what my guest is going to say. So thank you very much. Um, but anyway, yeah, I really, really appreciate it. Um, so my next guest is going to be revealed on Sunday at 5 p.m. Just keep your eyes peeled for that. Can't wait to ask that question. Um, but Tammy Beaumont, thank you so, so much for joining me. I really, really appreciate your time. No worries. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I've really, I've really enjoyed it. I think it's fascinating to hear um, how you've got into the sport, how you've progressed and how the future of women's cricket is going to be so bright. So thank you so much. Um, and everyone else, thank you for joining us. Um, keep that kettle boil. Keep nattering using hashtag cup and the matter. And uh, see you on Monday, same time, same place. Thank you so much, Tammy. Cheers. Take care. Thank you.